What's what's a really bad historical film? Do you think? Now, see, we just spent a few minutes talking about one. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of Real History. I am your host, Jared Frederick. We have something very special lined up for you today. We are joined by New York Times best-selling historical novelist Jeff Shera, and Jeff is a very prolific author, uh, really monumental historical uh, fiction writer, and uh, he's going to be uh, talking with us today about some of his views on issues of history versus Hollywood, his methodology as a writer, and uh, above all else, I think the power of storytelling. Uh, that's uh, one of the big yeah. things that you always ruminate on a lot. Uh, and so let's go ahead and dive right in with some questions. So, Jeff, firstly, thank you for inviting us into your home and sitting with us for a, a few minutes. My, my pleasure. Happy, happy to have you here. All right. Thank you so very, very much. Um, I think a good foundation for starting our discussion is perhaps you can get into your method as a writer. Tell us a little bit about your works, the scope of your work, what drives you to do what you do? Well, first of all, for anyone who has no idea who I am, which is, I'm sure there's quite a few people, uh, I write historical fiction. I've written everything from the American Revolution up through the Mexican War, Civil War, a lot on Civil War, World War I, a lot on World War II, and Korea. Uh, and I've just finished a book on the life of Teddy Roosevelt. So I've sort of covered a, a lot of American history. Um, what I do, I, I'm not a historian in the sense that I, I'm not dealing with names, dates, places, facts, and figures. I, I don't write event-driven books. I write character-driven books. It's about the people. And the people that fascinate me, if, first of all, if they fascinate me, that's the only way they're going to fascinate you. Uh, so I try to find those characters that are fun to write the research is enormous. The research is the biggest part of it. I mean, it, I will tend to read 30 to 40 books for every book that I write. And it's wherever possible, diaries, memoirs, collections of letters, the accounts of the people who were there. It does me very little good to read a biography written by a modern biographer because you're getting the biographer's take on who the character is. I need to hear the voices. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean to sound mystical about that. I don't look for ghosts. But it, it is important to hear, you know, I'm putting words in the mouths of significant historical characters. They had better be the right words. Um, because if, if, they're, if I fudge it a little bit, or if they're a little counterfeit, you'll know it. The reader will know it immediately, and the book just doesn't work. So my goal is to get to know these people as, as closely as I can, as, as possible, so that I feel comfortable putting words in their mouths, that I feel like I know their personalities. And also we have documentation. Oftentimes the one scene I refer to, uh, Appomattox between Grant and Lee, almost word for word, they wrote down mm -hmm. everything that was said. Well, that's easy for me. I mean, that's easy to, to duplicate that. But that's a rare, a rare occasion when you're talking historically, whether you're talking about George Washington or Dwight Eisenhower or whoever, you know, everywhere in between, what was said? Well, that's my job is to fill in the blanks. You know, I, one of the things also that I do that a lot of fiction writers don't do is I'm painstaking in getting the facts straight. Get the, get the history right. Um, you know, I had a, a Bud Robertson, you know, the, the late Bud Robertson said to me one time, well, you're lucky because you can do anything you want to do because you're writing fiction. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to worry about the facts. Well, I don't agree with that mm -hmm. because what I'm doing is I'm, and I'm, I'm educating, which I, and I did not set out to do that. I hear from other people that I'm educating them on history and I'm just trying to tell a good story. Mm -hmm. uh, but if the facts are accurate, people realize they're learning the history while they're being entertained. That's a perfect world for me. If I can do, if I can pull that off in my stories, then I'm doing my job right. Mm -hmm. And I, I aspire to do the same thing in the classroom because, after all, the root word of history is story, and you can't tell history without telling a good story. And I think why so many people find your books appealing is that it is not just a timeline of facts, figures, dates, and statistics, because so often that's how it's taught in high school. Right. And so oftentimes when I get students in the classroom, it's a clean slate that I'm being delivered. Right. Uh, and so I, I aspire to the same thing you mm -hmm. do. And I think 
what you said is a good segue to our next question. For all of us who are historians or history buffs, there are often these foundational moments that we can look back upon. We think that is the moment where I started to, I was gravitating toward the past. Um, for me, it is when I saw the movie Gettysburg, based upon your father's work. Uh, for you, and perhaps for him as well, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, it was a trip to Gettysburg when you were a child. But right. I, I have kind of a two parts to this question. Perhaps you can tell us a little bit about that trip and why it was so significant for your family. Well, we went, it was, we visited the New York World's Fair in New York in 1964. I was 12 years old. And we took a side trip to Gettysburg, had never been here before. Uh, came to Gettysburg for me. The, the, I was the Civil War kid. Mm -hmm. I, I played with all the soldiers and mm -hmm. used to set up these elaborate battles in my bedroom with the, the blue and the gray and the cannons and the whole thing. And, and my mother would throw me out of the house. Um, but we went to Gettysburg as tourists and, you know, drove all over the battlefield. My father did an enormous amount of reading and sort of boned up on what, was, what, what we were seeing. And he was first and foremost a storyteller. And he knew a good story when he saw one. And he became really affected by driving around Gettysburg, learning about people like Joshua Chamberlain mm -hmm. and John Buford and Longstreet, and realizing that there was a story here he wanted to tell. Now, he had never done anything historical before or, or since. Uh, I mean, that was the Killer mm -hmm. Angels. Killer Angels was the only historical work he ever did. But again, it's because he saw the story that, that really grabbed him. And it took seven years. It took him seven years to write The Killer Angels. It was an obsession. Mm -hmm. And I can remember one of the things I learned, as I just talked about research, I learned my father's way of doing the research. He would get stacks of books mm -hmm. would be you know, all over his study where he would be getting from the library lending programs. Back then there was no internet, there was none of that. And so Florida State University, where we, we were living in Tallahassee, they would borrow a book and he'd have to track down whether it was a biography of Chamberlain or Longstreet's memoirs or something like that. And it took him uh, a while, to, to. it might take him three or four months to get his hands on a book. Well, the advantage I have today is literally with the internet and a couple of the websites that I use within a week and a credit mm -hmm. card, I have a library. Yeah. Um, but that wasn't the case for him. But that trip if affected him emotionally. Uh, I mean, the, the, I can tell a long story, and I'll, I'll try to keep it brief here, but he was telling me, he and I walked across Pickett's Charge. We, we took that walk from the Lee Monument across to the, to the high water mark. He's telling me the story of Louis Armistead. And he, you know, he's telling me as Armistead is walking, the same footsteps we're walking in, and he's telling me about Hancock on the other side waiting for his, and the fact they were friends, and all of that, which a lot of people, of course, know that story. But what I didn't expect is we stepped over the, the rocks, stepped over the, the wall on the Union side when you get up to the high water mark, and there's a little concrete monument that people see all the time. Um, and we didn't know what this was, and there's a little Confederate flag sticking out of the ground. Well, it's on the Union side mm -hmm. of the line. Oh, you know, what is that? Walked over and looked at it, and it's the place where Armistead fell. My father began to weep. Mm -hmm. I'm 12. I've never seen my father wow. cry before. That moment, and I realized in hindsight, I realized looking back at that, at that moment, he was Armistead. Mm. I mean, he's telling me that story because he's in the man's head and he's, he's telling me from Armistead's point of view. That's the way he wrote. That lesson is something I've carried with me in every book that I've done, is, is you have to, as I said before, it's not just hearing the voices, it's being a part of the voices. Mm -hmm. and, I, and that watching him go through that emotional experience, which, which changed his life, I mean, very definitely at that moment. And of course, in hindsight, it changed my life as well. Mm -hmm. That's that's powerful. And it, it speaks to the power of place. It speaks yes. to the power of story. And, you know, I'll admit, I, I saw the movie before I read the book, and I mm -hmm. suspect that was true for many, many people. Oh, sure. you know, mm -hmm. I was first grade or so when I, when I saw the movie. Um, but on, on a point connected to that, uh, with you being a history buff at a young age, were there any historical films that drew you into the story in a similar way that trips or books did? You know, you, you sent me that question to sort of ponder, and I have pondered it, and it's a difficult question to answer. 
because I can remember the films that, I mean, you know, if, if you think about John Wayne, I mean, there, there's, you know, 50 films on war right there. None of those make my list. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, in fact, a couple of them make the list on the other side. But, <laughs> um, you know, a film like Bridge Over the River Kwai, you know, which I saw as, as a young man, um, I mean, that really affected me. That was a great film. Mm -hmm. The Great Escape is another one. You know, again, fabulous characters. Um, Full Metal Jacket. I think Full Metal Jacket, to me, in my opinion, and people will disagree, is the finest Vietnam film mm -hmm. that's been made. Um, you know, on and on, I mean, All Quiet on the Western Front, the, the, the anti-war films, like All Quiet on the Western Front, Paths of Glory, which show, focus more on the horror of war, and as opposed to the John Wayne, you know, glory of war. Um, but I think, you know, seeing, I remember seeing, um, well, Lawrence of Arabia. Mm -hmm. I saw that in the theater as a kid. Um, long movie yeah uh, but what a spectacular yeah. film but you know it, 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 in every case what I'm describing are films that the reason why they stick in your head they're great stories yeah. it's not that that particular episode of the war whichever war it might be World War One World War Two um, is particularly you know will grab you it's the characters that grab you, and it's what what you see on the screen, and you identify whether it's an actor like James Garner, or Steve McQueen, or William Holden, whoever it might be. Um, they're so good at what they do that they pull you right in. Yeah, and that to me, that's what makes a good yeah. movie. And it, your reference to Lawrence of Arabia is a, a really apt one, huh? mm -hmm. because that was one of the films that inspired Steven Spielberg to become mm -hmm. a filmmaker <laughs> as well. Uh, so it inspired many, many young people who saw it in theaters, I suspect. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of people may not realize that your dad himself was a veteran. Mm -hmm. uh, he was in the 82nd Airborne during the Cold War era. Right. And I'm wondering... If, if he ever articulated any of his views on any of those sort of John Wayne style war movies, and I've often wondered if The Killer Angels is some ways his response to movies like that, or, or just how society looked at war, if he tried to bring a more human realistic element to warfare. I don't know that he compared himself to anyone else. Mm -hmm. um, he never, he sort of thought he was better than everyone else in a lot of ways, <laughs> especially as a writer, and that was just his own particular affectation. But no, I mean, he was not a John Wayne fan, mm -hmm. um, but he very definitely, Lawrence of Arabia and All Quiet on Western Front and, and uh, Bridge Over the River Kwai, I mean, though Stalag 17 is another one. I mean, those were movies that he introduced me to and, and you know, showed them to me and got me involved in them, whereas the a lot of the stuff, and, and I hate to rag on John Wayne, but I mean, the, you know, when you're talking about Sands of Iwo Jima and uh -huh. the Green Berets, which is horrific in my mind, um, they're cartoons uh -huh. in a way. I mean, they're not, there's no substance there. Um, they're so cliche, and the characters are so cliche, uh, and you get away from that, and, and again, it's about telling a good story. So that's what he related to, mm -hmm. uh, and that's what he shared with me. Mm -hmm. And, of course, he worked a number of years with Ron Maxwell, trying right. to perfect a script to an extent, trying to... Uh, it was a very long, arduous journey to have that movie uh, made into a film. It was almost made in Europe. The yeah. cast was always changing. Um, and, of course, he never gets to see the film Correct. hit TV screen or the big screen. What what was the what was the experience like for your family in the early 1990s when you finally reached the finish line? That movie's finally made. Was it was there uh, how emotional was it? Was it cathartic? What 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 was it like to see the filming process? Can you share any anecdotes yeah. on, on that point? First of all, I'll, I'll share an anecdote prior to that. You mentioned my father working with Ron Maxwell over the years. Ron gave my father a homework assignment. He said, take the book, write the screenplay. Mm -hmm. Just take the book and just convert it to a screenplay. Why not? I mean, why not just give it a try? My father wanted to do that. So my father comes up with the screenplay, and he, he basically takes the book word for word yeah. and puts it into the format of a screenplay. It's 600 pages. That doesn't work uh, yeah. in Hollywood. <laughs> I mean, a two-hour movie in Hollywood is usually a 120-page screenplay. So double that you know, for, for Gettysburg. Um, but yeah, no, a 600-page screenplay. So Ron had to say, well, you know, thank you very much, appreciate uh, the effort, but no, we're not doing that. Um, 
But I was on the set uh, for a brief time during the filming. I felt very out of place and very awkward. Um, I mean, I, they were treating me like a VIP. I didn't feel like a VIP. Uh, I mean, they picked me up at the airport in Harrisburg in a limo and all of this stuff. And I mean, I'm very sheepish about all this. And the, the, one of the first scenes I saw was the scene where Buford um, where it, if you think about the movie Gettysburg, there's the scene when the horse, one of Buford's colonels comes galloping in and there's a line of horsemen coming in behind him and the bugle sounds and they come and the guy jumps off the horse to tell Buford what's going mm -hmm. on. I was there for that scene and Maxwell was scared to death because they had all the cameras set up, all this equipment is set up, the horses are coming right at the camera well, Buck Taylor, who was the, the colonel, who played the colonel, who was an expert horseman, mm -hmm. it's a good thing because when they, they filmed that in one take. And I mean, these guys are galloping down the fence line and literally Taylor, before the horse even stops, he leaps off the horse and hits the ground. The horse stops feet in front of these cameras, <laughs> you know, a million dollars worth of uh -huh. movie equipment. And, it, and the scene goes on the way it's planned mm -hmm. perfectly, and it was no problem. But I remember Maxwell saying that he just knew the horses were just gonna run right over the camera, <laughs> that everything was gonna be this disastrous mess. The other, one of the other anecdotes, um, I know Patrick Gorman, who plays John Bell Hood, is also a really good horseman uh, and a really good guy. And he told me there was a scene where they had all the horses and John Bell Hood, who he portrays, um, were over in one part of the field, over what is today the Confederate part of the lines. And they, were, they had enough daylight to shoot one more scene over by Devil's Den. And they were getting the trailers ready to take the horses and put them in the trailers. And, and Gorman says, no, whoa, 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 wait, we'll just ride. It'd be so much faster, and we can get over there in no time. So he has his, his staff, and who are all good reenactors, good horsemen. They go galloping across the field, you know, to get over toward Devil's Den. I've always wondered what would it be like if you're that family from somewhere in, you know, Iowa, and you're out there visiting the battlefield, and you're walking around, and here comes General John Bell Hood <laughs> and his staff on horseback riding by. And if, you know, if anybody was willing to admit that they actually saw that mm -hmm. or, you know, did you see that? I didn't see that. Uh -huh. <laughs> so people then they go back and do the ghost tour that night. Uh -huh. um, but, yeah. but there were a lot of fun things yeah. like that. I met Sam Elliott um, and I'm embarrassed to say this. They had lunch out in the middle of the field, a uh, stubble cornfield. They had a tent pitched and they had a little buffet thing set up there. And Ron said, you know, get a tray, go, go get you some lunch. I'm okay. So, um, I'm scooping stuff on my tray and I turn around and I bump into Sam Elliott with his tray and almost knock him down, almost spill his lunch. He's in full General Buford regalia, you know, with the dirty face and the, and the whole thing. And that was my introduction to Sam Elliott as I almost wiped him out. So I felt kind of bad about that. But the overall feeling of, of and, and, and this leads to another story, the overall feeling was being impressed and being impressed that I'm there and my father's not, mm. because what would it have been like for him? Yeah, you know, to see this, to see his book, and we can talk about my book later mm -hmm. when I had the same experience, but to see his book brought to to film, um, and see the actors and 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 speaking the lines that my father wrote. Um, I mean, what a wonderful experience yeah. that was. I wrote Ron Maxwell a letter when I got home and expressed this, the emotion of it, that I, how much I deeply appreciated what this meant to my family, um, to see my father's great work being honored this way. Um, Ron, that letter, he, he says that that letter is what clued him into the fact that I should be a writer, mm. just by that letter. Um, now, I, whether that's completely accurate, I, I, I can't say, but it, it impressed me. Uh, I mean, I, I, was, I was amazed by that. But what an emotional experience. Mm -hmm. um, and and seeing, you know, meeting the actors and going to dinner with Tom Berenger and all the Confederate guys and all that stuff and Martin Sheen. And Martin Sheen's wife made cookies for everybody. I mean, there's little, little pieces of, of things like that that it just made it fun. Mm -hmm. um, and, and at the same time, extremely intimidating. Mm -hmm. Because again, I was nobody. I mean, I'm just sort of standing there feeling like I'm in the way. 
Um, and they went out of their way to make sure I, I did not feel that way. Mm -hmm. But it was quite an experience. I can well imagine. Those are some great stories mm -hmm. that you shared. Uh, so a few years after the movie comes out, your own novel, Gods and Generals, comes out. And that too, about a decade after Gettysburg, mm -hmm. uh, comes out as a, as a film adaptation. Um, and as some people, myself included, were of the mind that perhaps it would have been a stronger film if you had written the screenplay. Uh, and so we don't have to get into that too deeply, but I'm interested, had you written the screenplay, how would you have possibly structured it differently from the product that eventually hit theaters? I have to be very careful okay. how, how I answer this, um, because I don't want to cast major aspersions on anybody. Um, had I written the screenplay, it would have been a better movie. <laughs> um, I, it would have been more the book. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things about, I mean, the, about Gettysburg is 90% of the killer angels. Yeah. I mean, there are lines of dialogue, paragraphs of dialogue, word for word taken from yeah. killer angels. Gods and Generals is about 10% of my book. Yeah. When I saw the unedited six-hour version in a screening room in Hollywood, I was out there at the, you know, at the behest of the movie makers, and I'm, I'm in this little room with a few reporters, and this should have been the happiest day of my life. I mean, here's my movie up on the screen, and I see it, and there are scenes making me squirm in my chair. And I, I you know, I said, what have they done? Mm -hmm. um, you know, this is not my book. Um, that was hard. Um, I was on the set, uh, and I, I've said this to people, and I, I don't want to sound snarky about this, because, I mean, I, you know, here I'm an author, I wrote a book, and they made a major motion picture out of my book. How many authors would cut off an arm, mm -hmm. you know, to have that done? Um, so I have to, you know, I don't want to sound like I'm this spoiled brat, but I, when I was on the set, I would see things that were not right, mispronunciations of names, mm -hmm. for example, and I would and I would say hello, uh, you know, um, and they would say, oh, thank you very much, appreciate that, and then they'd absolutely ignore what I just said. Mm -hmm. And I've said this many times to people. And again, I don't want to sound too snarky about it, but I've said in Hollywood, what I learned, it's the author's job to stay out of the way. Mm -hmm. You know, that this becomes someone else's vision, it's someone else's ego, someone else's personality, and so the movie takes on a different kind of aura than what I would have intended. And it's not the book. Mm -hmm. And I tell people many times, who say, oh yeah, I saw Gods and Generals, haven't read your book though, and I tell them, read the book because it's a whole different experience. Um, the, the, you know, one of the knocks about the film, and again, I don't want to harp on this, but it is very pro-Confederate. And the book is not, the, but the book's not anti-Confederate. It's point, balanced. Well, that's what my father did with mm -hmm. the Killer Angels. That's the lesson I learned. It's both sides of the fence. Right. Gods and Generals, the movie is much more geared towards Stonewall Jackson. Right. Um, and Stephen Lang is, to me, the best thing in the movie. He does a fabulous job portraying Stonewall Jackson. But that's most of the story. Mm -hmm. and, and there's a happy slave. And there's no happy slave in the book. And, you know, the little things like that. And again, I'm not, I'm not going to pick on it, pick it to pieces. But it was a disappointment. And it should have been better. And I mm -hmm. wish it could have been better. And had it been better, they would have made the third movie. Mm -hmm. I mean, Ted Turner always said all he wanted to do was break even on, on Gods and Generals. He broke even. He would have greenlit the, the last full measure. Mm -hmm. We would have had a trilogy. And he lost too much money. And yeah. so he pulled the plug. Mm -hmm. I've, I've known you for many years now. And I've, I've chatted with you at many book signings. And the question that I always hear from people who buy your book is, when is The Last Full Measure going to become a movie? And as you said, mm -hmm. there's, there's no immediate plans for that happening. But I'll ask you a different question that stems from that. Um, what, which of your other books do you think is most worthy for the Hollywood treatment? Which one do you think would really stand out? I have an, an easy answer for that. It, it's probably my best book. Uh, it's The Frozen Hours, which is the, the Chosen Reservoir story in Korea. Um, it's, a, it's a small story in the sense that it just focuses on a few people. Um, and the, the Fox Company that's on top of, you know, the Fox Hill in, in Korea, uh, 40 below zero, fighting the Chinese. Uh, it is a horrific uh, 
episode in the lives of Marines in this country. Uh, the, the book won three awards, including one from the Marine Corps, which I'm very proud of, and one from the Congressional Medal of Honor Society, which it doesn't get much better mm -hmm. than that. Um, and it, it's it's a story with a, just a few characters that you wouldn't have to it wouldn't have to be a spectacular you know four thousand reenactor kind of story, um, and it's it's a good story, mm -hmm. and I think that would I think that would make an excellent film, and it's never been done. Right. I mean Hollywood. There's there are a few Korea film. I mean you know Mash is one obviously Pork Chop Hill, um, which is an American defeat by the way. Um, but the story of what happens to the Marines at the Chosin Reservoir is a story every American should know. Right. And I've spoken to people whose fathers and grandfathers were there and never talked about it. And they say, gee, until I read your book, I had no idea. And, uh, you know, that, that's powerful mm -hmm. for me to hear that. Um, but I think that's the, that's, to me, that's the one that jumps out. Mm -hmm. And um, around the time we're filming this, um, just a few weeks from now, um, there is a Korean War movie coming out yep. called Devotion, based on the book by Adam Makos. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe if that finds an audience and uh, people find out that there is fascination with the Korean War mm -hmm. long overlooked, uh, maybe it will someday get the Hollywood maybe. treatment. It's, maybe. Cer it's certainly worthy of it. Um, so you've talked about your your uh, some of your more recent books. Um, perhaps you'd like to talk a little bit about your continuation and your examination of the Second World War maybe offer a little bit more insight on uh, some future works, if you can, before we conclude. I did a series, of, I set out to do a trilogy on the war in Europe. And I started with North Africa, which is a lot of Americans don't realize that when the United States goes to war against Hitler, we don't go to Europe, we go to North Africa. And there's a whole, you know, Rommel is a fabulous character. He's one of the voices on the other side. Um, so it's a, the trilogy is the, the, the Rising Tide, the Steel Wave is the second book, which is Normandy, logically enough. Just like Gettysburg, Normandy is not is the great battle at the end of the war. There's still a lot more war to go, just like with Gettysburg. So I, you know, Normandy fit that profile very well. The third book is called No Less Than Victory. It's the Battle of the Bulge and the Fall of Hitler, uh, the Holocaust, a little bit of that. Um, and so that was going to be a thing, I mean, a, a set of the three. I got an awful lot of letters from Marines saying, wait a minute, there's this other war, what's this Europe stuff? You know, there's this <laughs> other war halfway around the world. You don't even talk about that. Fair enough. So I did a fourth book, which actually ties into the other three on the end of the war in the Pacific. So it's chronological, and it's Okinawa and the bomb. And I learned a lot, uh, the, uh, Colonel Paul Tibbetts, you know, the Enola Gay dropping the bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki and what all that was about. It. And it's a, f a tremendous story. Okinawa is a tremendous mm -hmm. story. Um, well, th that was, was it for a while. And I went on from there to, do, to go back to the Civil War and did another series. Um, and then the more I thought about it, I realized, you know, I really should do more on the Pacific. So I went back and did a two book set. This is my most recent set. I did Pearl Harbor and Midway. And the Pearl Harbor story, it's not just, I mean, I hope none of, nobody ever describes any of my books as blood and guts, because that's not what it is. Um, but it's a story of a young man who joins the Navy um, because his buddy does. He's sort of conned into it by, by peer pressure. And he joins the Navy and he ends up serving, what do you know, on the USS Arizona. And it's also some of the politics before the lead up to Pearl Harbor. So you see what, what, why was Pearl Harbor the mm -hmm. way it was? It's not just Japanese planes are bombing American ships and that's the story. It's a lot more to it than that. It's, it's what led up to it six months before and the mistakes that were made by the United States, by people in the U.S. government who just blinded themselves to what the Japanese were doing. And then on the other side, you know, Admiral Yamamoto, who's a fabulous character, and his planning, I mean, he's the one who put the whole plan together, and, how, and then some of the pilots on the Japanese ships, what they went through. Um, I was very happy the, the way the book, the, the book turned out. Um, and, from, and To Wake the Giant is the, the title of the book, which comes from a quote from Admiral Yamamoto when he, he talks about it, paraphrases when he talks about he's not really sure this is a good idea because, you know, America's a sleeping giant. 
And, you know, the, the, he's been, what I love about Yamamoto, and I'm getting way off track here. That's all right. What I love about Yamamoto, he's been to the United States. Right. He's been to Detroit, and he's seen the auto factories. He's been to Texas. He's seen the oil wells. He knows what kind of resources we have. And he knows that, you know, once we stir that pot, um, it's not going to stop. You know, so we need to make sure this happens. We strike hard and fast, and we're going to have about six months before it comes back to bite us. And he's absolutely mm -hmm. right, because the six months later mm -hmm. is midway. Six months and, exactly, almost, yeah. Yeah, and that's the, the, that's the, the, the second volume of the set, um, The Eagle's Claw, it's called. Um, and it's, it's the story of what leads up to midway, the, the, um, uh, the, the fabulous the code breakers and what we succeed in breaking uh, the, the Japanese code so we know what they're going to do. And they have no idea we've broken their code. And so we lay in wait and, it's, and we set a trap for them. And we sink four Japanese aircraft carriers. That's the heart of their fleet. And after that, and what people you know, you know, who may have heard of Midway, but may not appreciate the significance that after Midway, the Japanese are never the same. You know, the Japanese are winning the war up until June of 1942. And from that point on, it's a war of attrition going the other way. And it's because of Midway. Um, I love that story. And, and it, it ends up, again, as an American pilot uh, who, you know, who flies the, the, the fighters. Um, and it's, it's just, it deals with Yamamoto on the other side and some of the Japanese commanders and the mistakes they make, um, as well as uh, Admiral Nimitz you know, in Hawaii, who's pulling the strings, who's running the show. Um, and I, I really enjoyed that two book set. Now I've gotten grief because people want more. Mm. Uh, the next logical chapter in that would be Guadalcanal. Guadalcanal. The problem with Guadalcanal is it's four months long <laughs> and it, to, to turn that into one single book, it's also very repetitious. The Marines get shot up, the Japanese get shot up. The next day they go out and do it again. And it, that goes on for four months, and there's some Navy action there as well. It's a tough story to write. So I, I left those two books alone as a two-book series because my publisher wants me to get away from strictly doing war books. Mm -hmm. I don't like it when people describe what I do as war books, but let's be realistic. I mean, they, they're war books. Um, so they, what they're saying is, and I don't know how accurate this is, but they're, they're the people with the marketing mm -hmm. people and all that stuff. The, you know, military books are sort of out of fashion now, and, and they want me to turn my, after 18 books, they want me to turn my, my focus in a different direction. So I did a book, I just finished it, it'll be out next May. It's a novel on the life of Teddy Roosevelt. And I've gotten huge, every time, it, it, you know, it's funny, I'll test an audience. I'll be giving a talk somewhere, and I'll tell them, I'll mention this, and then I'll wait to see what <laughs> that sort of gut reaction you get from the audience. Because if you get a, ah, oh, then, oh, then I'm in big trouble. Every time I mention Teddy Roosevelt, I get a, oh, <laughs> you know, I get that response, which is great. Yes. I'm so happy to yes. hear that. But so the book will be out next May. Um, is, it's called The Old Lion, and it follows his life in hindsight from you know, his last days as an old man and when he's dying. And he has a reporter who's, who's this is accurate, it's a, a, a real person, comes to visit him and is taking notes and mm -hmm. is asking him questions. The questions spur flashbacks of different adventures in his life, including his childhood, you know, the, the asthma he suffers through and things that happened to him as a kid, and then all the way up through um, going to the D D Dakotas, you know, going out west, and the Spanish-American War. I mean, there is war here. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the Rough Riders are there. His presidency, um, and then his trip to the Amazon, which almost kills him. Yeah. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed doing this story, and I, I hope... I hope my enthusiasm for it translate into, into it being a good book. Um, it's different than anything anybody's ever done about Roosevelt. It's not a biography. Mm -hmm. I'm not a biographer. You know, I, I just don't do it that way. It's a story, and it's a story told through his point of view. Um, I hope it works. It sounds like a great opportunity for Tom Berenger to reprise <laughs> his role as Theodore Roosevelt. The perfect comeback for Tom Berenger. That'd be all right. I love it. I love it. Well, that sounds absolutely fantastic. I look forward to seeing that. Do you have any concluding thoughts before we 
finish up? Um, no, I just, I think that the most important point I can make is in, in all of this talk um, is, you know, I'm not, I try not to be pretentious about this. I, I, people call me a novelist. I hate that. Uh, Sorry. That's a, that, that's, a, <laughs> that's a pretentious word. I'm a storyteller. It's just about finding good stories and putting them in a way that entertain you, that you like the story. If you learn something along the way, more power to you. That's not the purpose. The purpose is to find great characters and tell you the story the way they would tell it. And that's what I've done in every book that I've written, and I hope that continues, and I, and I hope it works. That's a fantastic way to wrap it up. Jeff, thanks so much for joining us oh, my pleasure, on this Jerry. episode, thank and thank you to all of you tuning in. Be sure to check out Jeff's website. It'll be available in the comments in our caption below. Uh, share your thoughts. Uh, have you read any of Jeff's books? Tell us which one you like most and why. And if you haven't read his books, please make sure that you do so because you will not be disappointed. So until next time here on Real History, stay curious.